Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the invite. Um, I'll be talking about management of a person that's got diabetes that's in the that's in the hospital. So I think in your setting, this would be a person that's admitted for for surgery or so on. You know, and how do you transition from their home insulin or their home treatment to to a hospitalised patient? Also, this would now be the ill patients. We have to avoid hypoglycemia in our patients um, um, when they're admitted in hospital. <coughs> This is, a, this is just a slide to show you also, once again, patients that are normoglycemic, less mortality, patients with diabetes, very, you know, bit, bit elevated. But really, this is the group that we are very, very concerned about. Most type 2 diabe diabetic patients do not know that they are diabetic. And unless you test for it, you're not going to be identifying these patients. And this is the type of patient that has a particularly high mortality, the undiagnosed diabetic. I think this is where we, as endocrinologists, need clinicians working with other conditions to identify these patients early on for us because patients do not pitch routinely for their discovery, vitality assessment, and they're found to be diabetic. They're usually found to be diabetic when they've got another problem that brings them to a healthcare provider. No, I'm talking any patient, yeah. Um, and do we have good evidence for this? And I'll just briefly take it, uh, show you a few examples. So this is NF-kappa B. It's an inflammatory marker. And you can clearly see if you give a patient glucose, you raise the NF-kappa B um, levels. Similarly, insulin is an anti-inflammatory agent. If you give a patient a dextrose infusion, maybe you'll increase the NF-kappa B levels. But however, if you give them insulin, you drop it um, markedly. So insulin is good for um, inflammation. Also, hypoglycemia stimulates coagulation. So thinking about um, your pregnant patients with, who are at risk to develop DVTs, etc. If they're hypoglycemic, you even add to, to the risk of having um, thrombosis. So the more hypoglycemia you've got, the greater your um, procoagulant factors are in your blood. But a very important thing, and, and this I cannot stress enough, if you have to choose between having low glucose, high glucose, or alt alternating high and low glucose levels, you would rather have the first two than the last one. Um, this is looking at oxidative stress markers. Um, and, we, and you can see clearly as if you alternate between high and low glucose, high and low glucose, you've got much higher oxidative stress markers. And this is a situation, especially in the inpatient setting, where you think now patients admitted for sepsis or is post-operative, a <coughs> lot of inflammation going. The last thing you want this patient to have is to fluctuate between high and low sugars. And I'll give you some strategies how to pre prevent that. So in summary, hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia is a pro-inflammatory condition. It's pro-oxidative and it's pro-coagulant. And the fluctuating blood glucose levels um, really induces oxidative stress and that we want to maintain a stable glycemic environment. It's always a question, chicken or egg, what comes first? Is a patient ill? That induces some stress hormones, and that, those stress hormones we know is diabetogenic. So cortisol, adrenaline, it raises your blood glucose levels, um, which further enhances lipolysis and so, uh, and so forth. Or is it, in fact, that our patient has diabetes, has high glucose and high fatty acid levels, and that negatively influences um, our, our illness? So it's, it's often a combination of both or, or either of the two situations. You've got an ill patient, it's in a stress response, and now the blood glucose levels are high, or it is a diabetic patient, and therefore this patient has acquired some form um, of illness. Um, I'm going to skip through this. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this and, uh, for, because I think this is more for, 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 from a physician's point of view. But, you know, take a good history and ask all your patients always, are you a diabetic? And we would advise that every patient on every admission at least get one random blood glucose level. And I, uh, just one thing I want to emphasize to you is if you do find that your patient's got a high blood glucose level, so that would be a random blood glucose level of more than 7.8. Remember that although 7.8, you might say, well, that is kind of a normal. That is actually an abnormal blood glucose level for a normal person, 7.8. Your blood glucose should never be more than 7.8 if you're not dysglycemic in some way. But then, if you are suspecting that the patient might be a diabetic, to do an HbA1c. Because that's really the only way for us to know, is this patient just having high blood glucose levels because they're now in a stressful environment, they've got sepsis on board or something um, like that, 
or is this patient, in fact, an undiagnosed diabetic? And as I told you, the patients we really want to identify in hospital is the undiagnosed diabetics. So HbA1c, it's a useful test. One, it's a useful test to make the diagnosis of diabetes. So <clears throat> if HbA1c is more than 6.5, that is diagnostic of, of diabetes. It tells us that for the past three months, at least, this patient had some form of dyslipidemia. But also, it's a good indicator of how good the patient's control was before they were admitted to hospital. However, and especially um, dealing with gynecology and um, obstetrics where bleeding disorders, multiple transfusions, things like that come into play, you have to realize that you are measuring HP. So any factor that would affect HP will affect your HP on C. So if you've had a patient recently with a large PV bleed who's got, who had lots of transfusions, probably an HP on C will not be a good measurement of their glycemic control or to make the diagnosis of diabetes. Um, <clears throat> Bedside blood glucose monitoring. So remember when you take a finger prick of a patient, that is capillary blood. That is not venous blood that you're actually testing. And we draw a conclusion that that is representative of a patient's serum um, blood glucose. However, there are specific conditions where this might not, be, uh, might not be an accurate reflection, especially conditions like shock, hypoxia, dehydration, patient that's very anemic or patient that's very polycythemic, so I think you can relate to this in your, your environment. So patient comes in, bled out, you've resuscitated the patient, do not necessarily trust the, the finger prick blood glucose level as being, being accurate. And especially, unfortunately, it goes to the lower side. So it will falsely elevate a blood glucose level as the hematocrit um, grid drops. So you might be m missing out on hypoglycemia in a patient with a low HP or who is shocked. So just be aware that if you are suspecting that your patient might be hypoglycemic, rather do a plasma blood glucose level than a finger prick. Don't always stress a finger prick glucose. So what would be our targets for, for treating patients in the inpatient setting? And these are fairly lenient targets. Please note this is not our targets for the obstetric patient, routinely outpatient. This is a sick patient in, in hospital. So we're looking at a fasting or a preprandial blood glucose value of 7.8. Like I said, that's a fairly conservative value. That is far from what a normal person's blood glucose would be in the fasting state. If the blood glucose level starts dropping below 5.6, this is more what a normal blood glucose level would be. You need to start reassessing whether um, you, you're not being too aggressive with your blood glucose management. And definitely, if it's less than 4, you should be starting to say, well, I'm causing harm to my patient and I should reassess my glycemic therapy. Random blood glucose levels, so this is typically after a meal, we would want to be at less than 10. Once again, very, very lenient um, target. However, you could be much more, um, much, much more relaxed with your targets and the appropriate patient, patient who's in for terminal cancer, patient with multiple comorbidities, you can say, well, I'll accept the blood glucose level less than 15. So you have to be realistic about your target. So, and this, I think, is something you need to help us with um, when calling us for advice, um, is to get your nurses um, involved with testing blood glucose level in a physiological manner. So we need blood glucose levels to, because our, our therapies are aimed at certain targets, so we need our blood glucose levels to be measured at certain targets. So if a patient's eating, we want blood glucose levels to be done in the fasting state. So that would be before meals, so before breakfast, before lunch, and before supper, and two hours after meals. Probably, preferably bedtime as well before the patient goes to bed. And just because we are using human insulin, so protophen as a long-acting insulin with a significant peak effect, which I'll show you just now, we want a 2 o'clock value just for safety purposes. If you're using the longer-acting analog insulin, which does not have a peak effect, probably don't need to wake the patient up at 2 o'clock in the evening to test their blood glucose levels. However, a patient that's fasted, it's fine. Then you can do random blood glucose levels every 4 to 6 hours. But if a patient's eating, we want to know where the blood glucose is in relation to a meal. So this is the chart that we use, and it's available. So if, if your ward does not have the chart, ask, ask for it. There is a standard um, glycemic control chart where this is before breakfast, after breakfast, before supper, and uh, before lunch, um, and so forth. <coughs> Dietetics is an absolutely essential component of managing an a, a, a inpatient diabetic. And if you, always when you ask students or patients what is a diabetic diet, 
they would tell you it's a diet that is devoid of any sugar, which is completely wrong. A hospital diet uh, for a diabetic is a diet that's got a predictable carbohydrate content. So we want to be able to know exactly how much carbohydrates a patient gets with each meal, and that it's a consistent amount of carbohydrate with every, every meal so that, that we can predict what type of inch or how much insulin to be giving our patients. And probably if you take nothing from this talk, this is my most important slide. You have to realize that when you hospitalize, uh, hospitalize a diabetic patient, it is a completely different scenario than a patient that is at home. What, firstly, this patient's got clinical stresses. They're septic, they're anxious about surgery, um, they are in a shock state, etc., etc. That's going to influence their glycemic control. They're going to be on a different diet that they would be on uh, um, at home. Experience in our ward, we've got uncontrolled diabetics. They come into our ward, and often we do nothing for the first 24 hours. We just put them on a ward diet, and the glucose is completely normalized. It's just poor eating habits, the fact that they need so much insulin while they're done. So while in hospital, they're on different diets, but also there are times when they are um, null per us. They're now inactive. They're, they're confound to a, bed, uh, to a bed, so they're not burning as much glucose as they might. You might be giving them medication that influences... Um, their blood glucose levels. And then, then, of course, they might be developing contraindications to certain treatments, such as renal failure if they get IV contrast, sepsis, and so forth. So, in my opinion, these drugs should never, ever appear on a, in an inpatient script. So, sulfonylureas, like liclozide or glimepiride, is a major cause of inpatient hypoglycemia. This is a long-term treatment for a patient. This is not for an ill, hospitalized patient, and you can cause profound hypoglycemia with sulfonylureas. Metformin is contraindicated in a number of conditions. Any patient who is at risk to develop renal failure will have an increased risk to have lactic acidosis. So if you give a patient contrast, surgical patients, renal insufficiency, shocked patients, these are all contraindications to metformin. So you have to be very selective in patients who, as an inpatient, you do give metformin to. Um, I'm not going to confuse you with the GLP-1s. And then atrophane, premixed insulin, it's far... So it's a premixed insulin, so you cannot manipulate any of the components. You can only manipulate the total dose. So it's not flexible enough for a sick um, hospitalized patient. So really, atrophane should not, not appear on inpatient scripts. So what is the answer to this? And probably know this. This is a, what we call a basal bolus approach. So where your basal insulin is a long-acting insulin, which basically, in your fasting state, suppresses gluconeogenesis. So your body's default is to make as much glucose as possible, and insulin suppresses it. So if there's no insulin on board, your body automatically will start producing more and more glucose. So basal insulin suppresses gluconeogenesis in the fasting state. So this is when you're not, and that is the biggest part of your day. You are not eating, so that, that is, um, well, hopefully not eating. Um, you are in the fasting, fasting state. Um, so this is a very important component. And then the nutritional or prandial insulin, a shorter-acting insulin, every single time you, you take a meal. And the advantage of this is if a patient does not take a meal, they do not get the insulin. So you can once again, so the patient's not active <coughs> twice a day, it's in. Now a patient vomits out the entire meal because they're nauseous post-operatively. You can do nothing about the fact that you've already given that patient short-acting insulin. However, if you're on a basal bolus, you can just simply emit the short-acting insulin. <coughs> so just one word about NPH. So it's protophane, which is unfortunately what we've got available in government setting. It's a human insulin, and it's not a long-acting insulin. It's an intermediate-acting insulin. At best, it works for 18 hours. Um, but um, so therefore we need to give it at night because else if you give it in the morning during the night time the patients will run out of insulin and especially in type ones have a risk of going into DKA. But also it's disadvantaged that it's got a significant peak effect which we typically see then in the late, in the um, early mornings. Um, so we overcome that by giving the patients a snack before be before bedtime and it's usually around about a quarter to half half of the total daily dose of in insulin. And then the short-acting insulin, which you also would know is act rapid. Um, but what you need to know, realize about this insulin, it's also it's a human insulin. It's not an analog. So it's got a long-acting effect. So it works up to eight hours. It's got this tail effect. So after a meal, a patient is still at risk to develop hypoglycemia. And this was what, what, what a, a dosing would look like, where you give this basal that covers during the night and these three short act rapid um, injections before each meal covering the meals. And the only reason why we can get away with this is because this act rapid 
during the daytime actually covers, that tail covers the basal need because there's no basal insulin. The basal insulin basically stops at 4 o'clock. So in the early evening, there's no insulin on board, but luckily the ACRAP, it covers that for us. So how do we initiate insulin? Quite simply, obtain the patient's weight and determine the patient's total daily dose. And this is where experience, unfortunately, comes, comes along, and we try to be very academic about it, but in the end, it's pretty much a thumb suck. And those of you who've been on our diabetic rounds, I think the obstetricians especially get very annoyed with us. They're like, how much insulin should it be on? And we're like, 14. How did you get to that? We don't know. But, um, but as a rule of thumb... <laughs> but as a rule of thumb, a safe starting dose would be 0.3 units per kg per day. There might be certain factors that would make you think maybe this patient needs to be on a bit more. Patient who's stuck too, it's got evidence of difficult control. A very obese patient, patient that's on steroids, you might consider maybe giving them a bit more. But you might even consider giving them a bit less. A patient who is especially concerned about hypoglycemia, maybe some renal failure, the elderly patient, rather be more conservative. Um, so I, I would start at about 0.3 units per kg per day for, for the patient. Um, I'm not going to go through that. So, we've t so let's say a patient's 60.3, that would be about 20, 20 units uh, about for the patient's total daily dose. And then you split it. More or less half, you give us the long-acting insulin before bedtime, and the other half in three separate doses before each meal. But importantly is to adjust daily um, according to, to what the glucose actually did during the day. So if you see after breakfast every day the sugar goes up to 16 for the next day, please adjust the act rapid that, it's a, it's, it's, that there's a higher dose of act rapid um, before breakfast. And this is also, I think, good prescribing technique and where you think, I think you need to help your sisters is to be specific when you prescribe insulin. Because the devil, unfortunately, when it gets to insulin is in the detail. Um, it's very important that insulin is dosed at the right times at the, um, in the correct manner. So don't write protophane 20 in its nocte. No one knows when is nocte. Is that at supper? Is that at, uh, at 12 o'clock at night? Act rapid 10 units TDS. When should it be? Um, rather be specific. Say protophane at 9. Act rapid 30 minutes before each meal um, and so forth. So last bit I'm going to talk about is the favorite old sliding scales. And I, I wrote the sliding scale myself because this is how I grew up. I grew up with sliding scales and I've written many, many sliding scales in my life. And it's actually a practice that we are trying to, to eliminate completely in this hospital. Why is a sliding scale a bad idea? Well, firstly, there's no flexibility. It doesn't, it doesn't take any of the clinical factors um, in account and it doesn't take in account is this patient eating? Is this patient not eating? There's no relationship to the meals. Um, but secondly, also, you get different patients. Where four units of insulin will be a lot of insulin for this thin patient, four units is going to be nothing for, 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 for this patient. So you have to take in individual patients into consideration. So the standard of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, if the sugar is 10, 10 12, it, it is an unphysiological approach to insulin. And really, you're always playing catch-up. And the way I try to, to simplify it is what, um, or to simplify the matter is, we, you're in a car and you want to drive at a constant speed. That is your aim. It's petrol effective to, to, to drive at a constant speed. And you're, you are approaching a hill. And this hill, just in terms of the analogy, that would be a meal. So we need to overcome the glycemic load of a meal now. So what you're basically doing when you're using a sliding scale is, some, somewhere when you hit that, that hill and you look at your speedometer, you realize, oh, I'm not at target. I'm driving at 25. I actually want to be driving at 60. I need to give some petrol now. The problem is you do not know where on this hill you are. Are you nearing the apex and it's going, it's going to be downhill from here? Are you only at the start of the hill? Or are you, in fact, on the hill at all? You do not know where you are. So you're just giving a random amount of, in, of, of petrol and if you overshoot, you're going to come crashing down on the other side. If you undershoot, you're going to end up short. You're not going to be able to reach the end of the hill. So similarly, if you just give every six hours, let's give some insulin according to what the sugar is, you do not know, is this after a meal, before a meal, what's the patient's situation like? And it's a very unscientific way of doing it. And then you end up with this roller coaster 
of insulin. We go up and down. So the sugar is high. Let's give a lot of insulin. It's too much. It goes down. And as I told you right at the beginning, the one thing we want to avoid is ups and downs in glycemic control. And we've actually got good, good evidence to show that sliding scales compared to basal bolus are bad. And if you're using sliding scales, you are living to about two decades. Um, practicing medicine is probably two decades old. So what we advocate is a correction dose. So this is how a correction dose works. You test the blood glucose level before a meal. You determine a dose to correct the, correct the blood glucose to the level that you want it to be, and then you add the normal amount of insulin that you would have given for the meal. So if I can slow, this is your correction dose. This is the amount of insulin that you need to correct the blood glucose level, to bring it down to where you want it to be, plus you give the dose, the, the predictable dose of the predictable meal that you're going to be giving this patient in any case, and you combine it into one injection. So if once, once again we think about the car, as you are approaching the hill, you check your speed. Okay, I'm driving at 55. I need to correct my speed to 60, and I need to give an additional amount of petrol to overcome the hill. Similarly, what is my blood glucose level? It is 10. I need to give two units to give, get it back to eight, and I need to give an additional six units for the meal the patient's about to get. So I give the patient eight units of insulin um, f um, bef before that meal. And the way you can do it is 5% of the total daily dose. So once again, a very insulin-resistant patient on very high doses of insulin, 5%, it's not going to be two. It's going to be much, much more than that. However, a very sensitive patient on maybe 20 units of insulin a day, 5%, it's going to maybe be one, one unit um, of insulin a day. So you need to titrate it according to patient. And more or less something like this, if the sugar is less than four, you must first correct the blood glucose. You would not give insulin to that patient and then give a dose to 5% units less, um, less than you would normally give. Between four and five, remember, we are cautious when it's less than 5.6, maybe give a little bit less. Between 5.6 and eight, okay, you're on target. You do not need to correct. You can just give the dose eight to 11, maybe one, one, um, Delta, if I can put it that way, 11 to 14, two deltas, 14 to 17, three deltas, and more than 17, you can give, give, give much more. Um, it's a much more physiological way, and it's much easier if one sisters get used to it, they only need to give insulin three times a day. So it's actually much simpler for them as well. But most importantly, it, um, review your insulin daily to avoid the need for correction. So if you see that your patient constantly needs correction doses, identify why, does he, why, why is my patient every time after breakfast have a high blood glucose level and adjust accordingly. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop, stop there. But I'm, So just my take on points, that we want good glycemic control as opposed to perfect glycemic control. You can be very lenient with your patients in the hospital setting, and you should avoid hypoglycemia at all costs. Um, you should be looking for diabetes, not only in patients who are diabetic, but also in the non-diabetics. Monitor according to what are the patients eating. Do not do random six-hour um, blood glucose levels. Test before meals, test after meals. Get your dietitians involved early on. Do not assume that your patient was on a sulfonylurea, metformin, and some protophane at home, that that is going to be appropriate when you admit your patient for surgery. Basal bolus plus um, Correction doses is the favorite way of, do, of, uh, of looking after patients in inpatient um, setting. Um, be specific in your prescriptions. Tell your sisters exactly when you want insulin to be given. Avoid hypoglycemia, even if it's at the cost of good control. And just finally, hospitalization is an ideal opportunity for you to make sure that your patient actually knows how to use the insulin, that they are using it correctly, that they see a dietitian, and all those things that they usually do not get um, as an outpatient. Thank you. Just to say, so I don't know if your department gets it, but the pharmacology department brings out a therapeutic bulletin um, every, I think it's about once a quarter. Um, so this was one that was um, just basically summarizes it on two pages on how to um, prescribe insulin in the inpatient setting. So this is available if anyone wants it. Um, and there are plenty of um, resources um, on the SEMSA website, the Endocrine Society, or the American um, College of Endocrinologists website specifically um, focusing on inpatient glycemic control. Thanks.
packed a lot into that lecture, and um, I'm sure there are going to be some questions to you. Uh, what I just wanted to, to ground you in before uh, we got far into the lectures, Alma was speaking to us generally, and often we interpret that as, as diabetes in pregnancy, but this was a general approach, as you're now all aware of. Any questions to Alma? Just um, perhaps to clear another misunderstanding out the way, when he was speaking about glycosylated hemoglobin using as a tool for diagnosis, that's a, new, that's a change that's happened. Um, that wasn't originally so, but that, that is so for established diabetes, and you, you cannot use the glycosylated hemoglobin to screen for gestational diabetes. And perhaps one other point is just remember that our glucometers that we use, Elmo was speaking about capillary versus venous glucose, and the, the specific glucometer that we use is standardized to make that correction as far as possible and correct the capillary glucose, which might be slightly higher, to the venous glucose, which might be slightly lower. But uh, to say, but there are those circumstances where it actually does not, no, because capillary, you know, capillary blood in a shock patient remains there much longer okay. um, than the normal blood would. In, in so I'm, I'm again yeah. referring to yeah. ordinary healthy patient yeah. and not those exceptional yeah. cases that um, that Elmo is referring to. Lindy, you've got a question. Thanks, Elmo. One of the challenges we've had is we've done, we've rolled out SSI, which is the Surgical Site Infection Initiative, which is in all the surgical disciplines. So with us, we're looking at cesarean section specifically. Mm -hmm. And one of the five bundle elements which we have to roll out is um, maintaining normoglycemia perioperatively. Mm -hmm. Now, it's quite loose. They just want, um, they want to avoid hypoglycemia, but to keep glucose less than 10. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, what we've done is we've started to monitor it. We haven't yet really looked at all of those numbers yet but we haven't been able to draw up an SOP to know what to do with it. So if we do find a non-diabetic patient who now intraoperatively has a sugar that's higher than 10, what kind of treatment do we institute? Do we have to acutely lower it? And if we do, then we don't know where to send the patient. Can she go back to a normal ward? So there's a couple of, we just don't know how to manage this group of patients that we might now pick up if we start mm. monitoring this more carefully. If you can maybe give us some ideas. Thanks. I mean, I think a single value just tells you your patient's dysglycemic. I don't know, you know, I would probably not react on a single value, but I definitely think that should prompt you to have more intensive monitoring afterwards. And if you see your patient's persistently above 10, you need to start some insulin on that patient in the hospitalized setting. Um, until, you know, cesarean section is settled, you know, patient's eating, not nauseous, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's where your oral agents become quite dangerous. If you start an oral agent, you, can't, you cannot reverse that. Whilst you can admit insulin, is, it's out within eight hours, so there's no risk for prolonged hypoglycemia. Um, but I think, you know, at least the tension just alert you to the fact that this patient is dysglycemic. And that is especially why I think you should be doing an HP1C right there and then to say, is this patient, patient perhaps a diabetic and I didn't know about it? Hopefully not in a cesarean section. Hopefully we will know patients are diabetic by the time they end up for a cesarean section. But, I mean, I think the, the patient who you know is a diabetic that goes for a cesarean section, they should be on insulin. Um, basal bolus, 0.3 units per kg. Um, yeah, I think that, that should be your therapy of choice. I think we're actually doing a great service. I don't want to say a great job yet, but I think in obstetrics we're doing a great service because we're very much aware of trying to diagnose undiagnosed pre-existing or diabetes mellitus. In other words, those patients that come in obese and don't realize that they have pre-existing diabetes. And so I think in the obstetric situation, many of those patients will be picked up, certainly not all of them, because they need to give us that opportunity. But I think Elma is also encouraging us to think about our obese patients who are coming in for gynecological surgery. In that sense, we don't have any system accept ourselves to think about that initially. And so I think he's encouraging us before we go into major surgery, et cetera, et cetera, to be thinking about are we dealing with a lady with undiagnosed established diabetes? Henny. Thank you for the excellent talk. Um, just on that same topic, um, if we do elective gynecological surgery in a, in a known diabetic, 
we obviously need to control the, the glucose, but what other me measures would you sort of routinely suggest we do? Pro maybe give them a longer um, prophylactic antibiotic course. I know that's controversial. Would you put, um, put them on um, thromboprophylaxis uh, a little bit earlier? Would you treat those patients any different if, um, if you do elective surgery on them? Sure. Uh, it's not a difficult question for me to answer as a diabetic um, trained person. I mean, I, I think one, just once again, I think you need to be cognizant that often these patients have been diabetic for a very long time. I mean, especially if you diagnose someone in, if you diagnose someone with type 2 diabetes, probably they've had diabetes for seven years, so they've got established dog and organ damage. So I think that is a person, those patients should at least get a proper anesthetic workup. I think that is one thing you should, you know, should be talking to anesthetists before about it, and especially silent ischemia. That is a big problem in diabetes, that they're often not symptomatic from, from, from ischemic heart disease. Um, I have to be honest, I don't know anything about post-operatively any special uh, you know, obviously an obese person, more risk for, thrombo for thrombosis, so thromboprophylaxis, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, there are no specific diabetic post-surgery, yeah, um, apart from good glycemic <coughs> control. I mean, it's definitely been shown that you will decrease your post-operative stay if you control the blood glucose level, and your risk for infection is, is much less, um, especially wound infection. And we know wound infection is a big problem in diabetes, poor wound dealing, et cetera. So, Good glycemic control, it, it, it's especially probably where we've got the best evidence for inpatient um, glycemic control is in the post-operative ICU setting where they've clearly shown that wound dealing, hospitals, length of hospital stay and so forth, glycemic control is important. So I don't think it's something you should be, you know, let's just see what happens. Let it, let, let it run a few days at, at, at glucose of 16. I think you should be aggressive and the aggression should be with insulin. Um, I think that's the big message I want to get. You do not treat this with sliding scales. You do not treat this with oral um, agents. This is a short-term thing. This patient is ill. You need to get on board with insulin early on. And if you're not comfortable getting, put, putting your patient on insulin, which I think every clinician here, diabetes is like hypertension. You should, you know, everyone should be, but I appreciate you're not dealing with this. You, know, you should get someone that's comfortable with insulin. But I don't think you should accept glucose of 16, 18, um, especially post-operatively. It does, does make a big difference.